Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry, Mildred D. Taylor, Chapter 4, Part 2. Before Mr. Morrison took the reins, he handed Stacy a handkerchief in which to wrap his bruised right hand, but he did not say a word, and it wasn't until we passed the crossroads leading to great faith that the silence was broken. Mr. Morrison, you going to tell Mama? Stacy asked huskily. Mr. Morrison was very quiet as Jack the Mule clopped noisily along the dry road. Seems I heard your mama tell y'all not to go up to that Wallace store, he said at last. Yeah, yes, sir, said Stacy, glancing nervously at Mr. Morrison. Then he blurted out, but I had a good reason. Ain't never no reason good enough to disobey your mama. The boys and I looked woefully at each other. Ooh, and my bottom stung from the awful thought of mama's leather strap against it. But Mr. Morrison, I cried anxiously. TJ was hiding there because he thought Stacy would not never come down there to get him. But Stacy had to go down there because TJ was cheating and... Hush, Casey, Stacy ordered, turning sharply around. I faltered for only a moment before deciding that my bottom was way more important than Stacy's coat of honor. And Stacy had to take the blame for it, and Mama whipped him right in front of God and everybody. Once the truth had been disclosed, I waited with dry throat and nauseous stomach for Mr. Morrison to say something, anything. When he did, all of us strained tensely forward. I ain't gonna tell her, he said quietly. Christopher John sighed with relief. I ain't going down there no more either, he promised. Little man and I agreed. But Stacy stared long and hard at Mr. Morrison. How come, Mr. Morrison, he asked. How come you ain't going to tell mama? Mr. Morrison slowed Jack as we turned into the road leading home. Because I'm leaving it up to you to tell her. What? We exclaimed together. Sometimes a person's got to fight, he said slowly. But that store ain't the place to be doing it. From what I hear, folks like them Wallaces got no respect at all for colored folks. And they just think it's funny when we fight each other. Your mama knows them Wallaces ain't good folks. That's why she don't want y'all down there. And y'all owe it to her and to yourselves to tell her. But I'm going to leave it up to y'all to decide. Stacy nodded thoughtfully and wound the handkerchief tighter around his wounded hand. His face was not scarred, so if, if he could just figure out a way to explain the bruises on his hand to Mama without lying, he was in the clear. For Mr. Morrison had not said that he had to tell her, but for some reason, I could not understand at all. All right, Mr. Morrison, I'll tell her. Boy, you crazy? I cried as Christopher John and little man speedily came to the same conclusion. If he did not care about his own skin, he could at least consider ours. But he seemed not to hear us as his eyes met Mr. Morrison's and the two of them smiled in subtle understanding, the distance between them fading. As we neared the house, Mr. Granger's packet rolled from the dusty driveway. Mr. Morrison directed Jack to the side of the road into the big car pass, then swung the wagon back into the road center and up the drive. Big Ma was standing by the yard gate that led into the drive, gazing across the road at the forest. Big Ma, what Mr. Granger doing here? Stacy asked, jumping from the wagon and going to her. Little man Christopher, John, and I hopped down and followed him. I'll nothing, Big Mama replied absently, her eyes still on the forest. Just worry me about this land again. Oh, said Stacy in his tone indicating that he considered the visit of no importance. Mr. Granger had always wanted the land. He turned to help Mr. Morrison. Little man and Christopher John went with them. But I remained by the gate with Big Ma. Big Ma, I said, what well, Mr. Granger need more land for? Don't need it, Big Ma said flatly. Got more land now than he know what to do with. Well, what he wanted ours then? Just to have it, that's all. 
Well, seems to me like he's just being greedy. You ain't going to sell it to him, are you? Big Ma did not answer me. Instead, she pushed open the gate and walked down the drive and across the road into the forest. I ran after her. We walked in silence down the narrow cow path, which wound into the, which wound through the old forest to the pine. As we neared the pine, the forest gapped open into a wide brown glade, man-made by the felling of many trees, some of them still on the ground. They had been cut during the summer after Mr. Anderson came from Strawberry with an offer to buy the trees. The offer was backed with a threat, and Big Mob was afraid. So the Andersons lumbermen came and chopping and sawing and destroying the fine old trees. Papa was away on the railroad then, but Mama sent Stacy for him. He returned and stopped the cutting, but not before many of the trees had already fallen. Big Ma surveyed the clearing without a word. Then spinning around the rotting trees, she made her way to the pine and sat down on one of them. I sat close behind her and waited for her to speak. After a while, she shook her head and said, I'm sure glad your grandpa never had to see none of this. Ooh, that man dearly loved these here old trees. Him and me, we used to come down here early morning at just for the sun was about to set and just sit and talk. He used to call this place his thinking spot. And he caught that old pine, that one there, he caught that Caroline. After me, she smiled vaguely, but not at me. You know, I, I was hardly 18 when Pa Edward married me and brought me here. He was older than me by about eight years, and he was smart. Woo! My Lord, that was one smart man. He had him a mind like a steel trap. Anything he seen done, he could do it. He had learned carpentry back up there near Macon, Georgia, where he was born. Born into slavery, he was two years for freedom, and him and his mama stayed on that plantation after the fighting was finished. But then, when he got to be 14 and his mama died, he left that place and worked his way way across here up to Vicksburg. That's where he met you, Big Ma, ain't it? I asked, already knowing the answer. Big Mama smiling. Big Mama nodded, smiling. Sure was. He was carpenter up there. And my papa took me into took me in with him to Vicksburg. We was tenant farming about 30 miles from there. To see about getting the store bought rocker for my mama. And there was old Paul Edward working on that furniture shop. Just as big. Had himself a good job. But that good old job wasn't what he wanted. He wanted himself some land. Kept on and kept on talking about land. And then his place come up for sale. And he bought himself 200 acres from that Yankee, didn't he? Big Ma chuckled. That man went right on over there to see Mr. Hollenbeck and said, Mr. Hollenbeck, I understand you got land to sell and I'd be interested in buying me by 200 acres if you price right. Old Mr. Hollenbeck questioned him good about where he gonna get the money to pay him. But Paul Edward just, just said, don't seem to me it's your worry. Worry how I get the money. And just as long as you get paid your price. Boy, I didn't nothing scare that man, she being proudly. And Mr. Hollenbeck went on and let him have it. Of course, now he was just about as eager to sell his land as Paul Edward was to buy. He had it going on for nine, twenty years. Bought it doing construction from the Grangers. Because they ain't have no money to pay their taxes, right? Well, not only they didn't they have money for taxes... Didn't have no money at all. That war left them plumb broke. Their old Confederate money wasn't worth nothing. And both Northern and Southern soldiers had done ransacked the place. Them them Grangers didn't have nothing but they land left. And they had to sell 200 acres of it to get money to pay the taxes and rebuild the rest of it. And that Yankee bought the whole 2000 Then he turned around and tried to sell it back to him, huh, Big Ma? Sure did. But not till 87 when your grandpa bought himself that 200 acres. As I hears it, that Yankee offered to sell all 2,000 back to Harlan Granger's daddy for less than a year land was worth. But that old Fillmore Granger was just about as tight with the penny as anybody ever lived. And he wouldn't buy it back. 
So Mr. Hollenbeck just let other folks know he was selling and didn't take long before he sold all of it because it was some mighty fine land. Besides your grandpa, a bunch of other small farmers bought up 800 acres and Mr. Jameson bought the rest. But that wasn't our Mr. Jameson, I supplied knowingly. That was his daddy. Charles Jameson was his name, Big Ma said. A fine old gentleman, too. He was a good neighbor, and he always treated us fair, just like his old son. The Jameson was what folks called Old South from up Vicksburg, and as I understand it, before the war, they had as much money as anybody, and even after the war, they managed better than some other folks because they had made themselves some good northern money. Anyways, old Mr. Jameson got it into his mind that he wanted to farm, and he moved his family from Vicksburg down in here. Mr. Wade Jameson wasn't but about eight years old. But he didn't like to farm, I said. Oh, he liked it all right. Just wasn't ever much hand at it, though. And after he went up north to law school and all that, he just felt he ought to practice his law. Is that how come he sold Grandpa the other 200 acres? Sure is. And it was mighty good of him to do it, too. My Paul Edward, he been eyeing that 200 acres ever since 1910 when he done paid off the bank for the first 200. But old Mr. Jameson didn't want to sell. About that same time, Harlan Granger come head of the Granger Plantation. You know, him and Wade Jameson about the same, about the same year as children. And he wanted to buy back every inch of land that used to belong to the Grangers. That man crazy about anything. That was before the war, and he wanted his land to be every bit like it was then. I already had more than 4,000 acres, but he just itching to have them have back them other 2,000 his granddaddy sold. Got back 800 of them, too, from them other farmers that bought from Mr. Hollenbeck. But Grandpa and old Mr. Jameson wasn't interested in selling, period, was they, Big Ma. They didn't care how much money Mr. Granger offered them. I declared with an empathetic nod, emphatic nod. That's the truth of it all right, agreed Big Ma. But when Mr. Jameson died in 1918, where well, he come ahead of the family, he sold them 200 acres to Paul Edward and the rest of his land to Harlan Granger and moved his family into Strawberry. He could have just as easily sold the 4,000 acres to the Grangers and gotten more money, but he didn't. And to this day, Harlan Granger still hold it against him. Because he didn't. The soft swish of fallen leaves made Big Ma look up from the pond and at the trees again. Her lips curved into a tender smile as she looked thoughtfully. You know, she said, I can still see my Paul Edwards face the day Mr. Jameson sold him them 200 acres. He put his arms around me and he looked out at his new piece of land. Then he said exactly the same thing he said when he grabbed himself them first 200 acres. 200 acres. Said, pretty Caroline, how you like to work this fine piece of earth with me? Sure did. Said the exact same thing. She grew quiet. Then she rubbed them wrinkles down one hand as if to smooth them away. I gazed at the pond, glass, glassy, gray, and calm until she went on. I had learned that at times like these, it was better to just sit and wait than to go asking, disrupting questions, which might vex her. So long ago, she said, eventually in a voice that was almost a whisper, we worked real, real hard getting them crops sown, getting them reaped. We had us a time. Oh, but there were some good times too, baby. There were some good times. He was a young and strong, and when we started out, we liked to work. Neither one of us, I'm proud to say, never was lazy, and we didn't raise us no lazy cheer neither. Had ourselves six fine children. Lost our girls when they was babies, though. I suppose that's one of the reasons I love your sweet mama so much. But them boys, they grew strong, all of them. They loved this place as much as Paul, Edward, and me. They go away, and they always come back to it. They couldn't leave it forever. She shook her head and sighed. Then Mitchell, he got killed in the war, and Kevin got drowned. Her voice faded completely. But when she spoke again, it had hardened. 
and there was a determined glint in her eyes. Now all the boys I got is my baby boys, your papa, and your Uncle Hammer. And this is they place as much as it is mine. They bloods in this land. And hear that Harlan Granger always talking about buying it. He pestered Paul Edward to death about buying it. Now he pestering me. Hmm. She grumped angrily. He don't know nothing about me or this land. He think I'm going to sell it. She became silent again. A cold wind rose biting through my jacket and I shivered. Big Mama looked down at me for the first time. You go. <sighs> no, no ma'am, I stuttered. Not ready to leave the forest. Ah, don't you go lying to me, girl, she snapped, putting out her hand. It's time we was going back to the house anyway. Your mama be home soon. I took her hand, and together we left the Caroline. Despite our every effort to persuade Stacy otherwise, when mama came home, he confessed that he had been fighting TJ at the Wallace store and that Mr. Morrison had stopped it. He stood awkwardly before her, disclosing only those things which he could honorably mention. He said nothing of TJ's cheating or that Christopher John Little Man and I had been with him. And when Mama asked him a question he could not answer honestly, he simply looked at his feet and refused to speak. The rest of us sat fidgeting nervously throughout the interview. And when Mama looked our way, we swiftly found somewhere else to rest our eyes. Finally, seeing that she had gotten all the information she was going to get from Stacy, Mama turned to us. I suppose you three went to that store too, huh? But before any of us could squeak an answer, she exclaimed, That doggone does it! And she began to pace the floor, her arms folded, her face crossed. Although she scolded us severely, she didn't whip us. We were sent to bed early, but we didn't consider that a punishment. And we doubted that Mama did either. How we had managed to escape a whipping, we could not fathom until Saturday when Mama woke us up before the crack of dawn and piled us into the wagon. Taking us southwest towards Smellin' Creek, she said, Where we're going, the man is very sick and he doesn't like other people. But I don't want you to be afraid or uncomfortable when you see him. Just be yourselves. We rode for almost two hours before turning on to a backwoods trail. We were jared and bouncing all over the rough road, jarred and bouncing all over the rough road until we entered a clearing where a small weather grade house stood and fields stretched barren beyond it. As Mama pulled up on the reins and ordered us down, the front door cracked wearily, but no one appeared. Then Mama said, Good morning, Mrs. Berry. It's Mary Logan, David's wife. The door swung wide then, and an elderly woman, frail and toothless, stepped out. Her left arm hung crazily at her side as if it had been broken long ago, but had not been mended properly. And she walked with a limp. Yet she smiled widely, throwing her good arm around Mama and, and hugging her. Lance Nates, child, ain't you something? She exclaimed. Coming to see about these old bones. I just see Sam. I see who you reckon coming to see old folks like us. These old babies, ain't they? <clears throat> Lord Almighty, ain't they fine? They sure is. She, she hugged each of us and ushered us into the house. The interior was dark, lit only by the narrow slat of great daylight allowed by the open door. Stacy and I carried cans of milk and butter, and Christopher John and Little Man each had a jar of beef and a jar of crowder peas, which Mama and Big Ma had canned. Mrs. Berry took the food, her thanks intermingled with questions about Big Ma and Papa and others. When she had put the food away, she pulled stools from the darkness and motioned us to sit down, then went to the blackest corner and said, Daddy, who you pose you done come to see about us? There was no recognizable answer, only an inhuman guttural wheezing. But Mrs. Berry seemed to accept it and went on. Miss Logan and her babies, ain't that something? She took a sheet from a nearby table. Gosh, to cover him, she explained. He cannot let stand to have nothing touch him. When, he, when she was visible again, she picked up a candle stump and felt towards the table for matches. 
He can't speak no more. The fire burned him too bad, but he understands all right. Finding the matches, she lit the candle and turned once more to the corner. A still form lay there staring at us with glittering eyes. The face had no nose and the head had no hair. The skin was scarred, burned, and the lips were wizened black like charcoal. As the wheezing sound echoed from the opening was his mouth. <sighs> Mama said, Say good morning to Mrs. Barry's husband, children. The boys and I stammered, stammered a greeting, then sat silently, trying not to stare at, at Mr. Barry during the hour that we remained in the small house. But Mama talked softly to both Mr. Barry, Mr. and Mrs. Barry, telling them the news of the community as if Mr. Barry was as normal as anyone else. <clears throat> After we were on the main road again, having written in thoughtful silence over the wooden trail, Mama said quietly, The Wallaces did this, children. They poured kerosene over Mr. Beer and his nephews and lit them afire. One of the nephews died. The other one is just like Mr. Berry. She allowed this information to penetrate the silence, then went on. Everyone knows they did it, and the Wallaces even laugh about it, but nothing was ever done. They're bad people, the Wallaces. That's why I don't want you ever go by their store again for any reason. Do you understand? We nodded, unable to speak as we thought of the disfigured man lying in the darkness. On the way home, we stopped at the homes of some of Mama's students where families poured out the tenant shacks to greet them. At each farm, Mama spoke of the bad influence of the Wallaces, of the smoking and the drinking permitted at the store, and asked that the family's children not be allowed to go there. The people nodded and said, all right. The people also agreed that she was right. She also spoke of finding another store to patronize, one where the people were more concerned about the welfare of the community. But she did not speak directly of what the Wallaces had done to the Berries, for as she explained later, that was something that wavered between the known and the unknown, and to mention it outright to anyone outside of those with whom you were the closest was not wise. There were many ears that listened for others beside themselves, and too many tongues that wag to those that shouldn't. The people only nodded, and Mama left. When we reached the Turner Farm, Mo's widowed father rubbed his double chin and squinted across the room at Mama. Miss Logan, he said, you know I feel the same way you do about them low-down Wallaces, but it ain't easy to just stop shopping there. They overcharges me, and I has to pay them high interest, but I got credit there because Mr. Montier signs for me. Now, you know, most folks around here share crap on Montier, Granger, or Harrison land. And most of them just about got to shop at the Wallace store or, at the, or up at the Mercantile and Strawberry, which is just about as bad. Can't go no place else. Mama nodded silently, showing she understood. Then she said, for the past year now, our family's been shopping down at Vicksburg. There are a number of stores down there, and we found several that treat us well. Vicksburg, Mr. Turner echoed, shaking his head. Lord, Miss Logan, you ain't expecting me to go all the way down to Vicksburg. That's an overnight journey in a wagon down, down there and back. Mama thought on that a moment. What if someone would be willing to make a trip for you? Go all the way to Vicksburg and bring back what you need. I won't do no good, retorted Mr. Turner. I got no cash money. Mr. Montier signs, signs for me at the Wallace store so I can get my tools, my mule, my seed, my fertilizer, my food, and what few clothes I need to keep my children from running plumb naked. When cotton picking time comes, he sells my cotton, take half of it, pays my debt up at the store and my interest for the credit, then charges me 10 to 15% more at risk money for signing for me in the first place. This year, I earned me near $200 after Mr. Montier took his half of the crop money. But I ain't seen a penny of it. In fact, 
If I manages to come out even without owing that man nothing, I figures I've done had a good year. Now, now who way down in Vicksburg gonna give a man like me some credit? Mama was quiet. She did not answer. I sure sorry, Miss Logan. I'm going to keep my youngest from up at that store, but I got I got to live. Y'all got to bend most folks around here because y'all got your own place. And y'all got its cow tail and a lot of this stuff. But you got to understand, it ain't easy for sharecropping to do what you're asking. Mr. Turner, Mama said in a whisper, what if someone backed your signature? Would you shop up in Vicksburg then? Mr. Turner looked at Mama strangely. Now who'd sign for me? If someone would, would you do it? Mr. Turner gazed into the fire, burning to a slow ash, then got up and put another log onto it, taking his time as he watched the fire shoot upwards and suck in the log. Without turning around, he said, When I was a wee little boy, I got born real bad. It healed over, but I ain't never forgot the pain of it. Ooh, it's an awful way to die. And then turning, he faced Mama. Miss Liz Logan, you found someone to sign my credit, and I consider it deeply. After we left the Turners, Stacy asked, Mama, who you gonna get to sign? But Mama, her brow furrowed, did not reply. I started to repeat the question. But Stacy shook his head, and I settled back, wondering, until I fell asleep.